Hi, welcome to the Fury Theory Podcast, brought to you by EFB Advocacy. EFB means excellent for business. I'm joined by my colleagues, John Easton and Adam Belmar. And we are also joined by special guest, Congressman Garrett Graves. Garrett Graves represents Louisiana's 6th District. He is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Water Resources and the Environment. He's a native of Baton Rouge and a huge LSU football fan. He and his wife, Carissa, have three children, and we are honored to have Congressman Garrett Graves here today. Hey, great to be here. Big I want, weekend for LSU. Too. Big weekend to play in Alabama. Go LSU. I have, well, I won't go into my football proclivities, but anyway. I want to make one thing perfectly clear. This is cold-pressed, nitro-infused coffee brought to you by Commonwealth Joe. It's coffee. Many people think it looks like Guinness, but we will have a podcast with Guinness at some point in time, but not 11 o'clock in the morning. This one is not it. And I can't wait for that one either. (laughs) So that's a caffeine buzz. It's a caffeine buzz. It's a caffeine buzz. Exactly. Theory one, it takes two to tango. Yesterday, Republicans unveiled a tax reform bill that will grow the economy, keep more American companies in America, give the middle class a big tax cut, while not not cutting taxes on the wealthiest Americans. You would think that the Democrats would climb on board, and yet the Democrats refuse to offer either a hand or a vote, hoping upon hope that the Republicans fail, that the economy fails, and that the president crashes and burns. Here's my theory. Democrats hate President Trump so much that they're willing to sacrifice the best interests of their constituents in pursuit of their partisan goals. That's a pretty partisan statement. I apologize for that. (laughs) Garrett Graves, you are a bipartisan kind of guy. I know that you're looking through this tax bill with a fine-tooth comb, making sure that it represents your constituents well. But you also worked as a staff member for two of the great deal cutters in the history of the House and the Senate, Billy Tozan and John Bro. You serve on a committee that has a long history of bipartisanship. So I would like you to give us your thoughts on this tax bill and then talk a little bit about bipartisanship and why we're in the state we are in in Washington, D.C. Well, do you mind if I flip that over? Yeah, please do. Uh, yeah. Right, so flip it over. So, so first of all, you know, whenever I'm home every weekend, people talk about us wanting, to, wanting us to get things done. They, they want actual progress. They want issues addressed. They want concerns addressed. They want government inefficiency addressed. The, the tax bill is something that, that is a, a no-brainer. I mean, the last time we updated the tax code was 1986. It has grown way too big. It's grown uh, with way too many special provisions that are exempting or crediting or deducting for certain individuals, industries, companies. It's not fair. It's not easy to comply with. You have to hire accountants. You have to get software. And so this, the, the goals of this tax reform uh, are simply to help people keep a larger portion of their paycheck, to help people who work hard keep a larger portion of their paycheck. One of the great things about the United States, and I think kind of a strategy for our success, that has worked out so well and why we are the country that we are, we have incentivized success, we've incentivized hard work, dating back to our founding. And so that's what this does. This this helps bring us back to that strategy. But something else that's really important to keep in mind, 1960, 17 of the top 20 global companies were located in the United States. Today it's six. And, and, and this whole thing about having an outdated tax code hasn't been modernized while other countries have, have been updated or modernized. We're no longer competitive. And that's what we're seeing, this bleeding of jobs. This helps bring jobs back, bring companies back, increase economic activity. And importantly, people keep paychecks and giving them more employment opportunities for growth. The, one of the keys of this package, and one part that's actually fairly unpopular, John Easton, is the corp, corporate tax cut. But it gets to your point, Congressman, that without the corporate tax cut, we can't get corporations back to America. What are your thoughts, John? Well, I think that's that, that's right. And 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 you know, throughout you know modern history, anyway, when you talk about corporations and benefits for corporations, that that's not a big winner with your electorate and, and in polling. But you know, if you look at President Trump, what, what he has been hounding on ever, ever since the primary, uh, the election of 2016. It's been about jobs, about bringing jobs back, uh, you know, growing the economy, and you can't really do that to its fullest extent without getting that corporate tax rate 
down a bit so that we can compete on the glo global scale. So bringing it down to 20 and his insistence on bringing it to 20 is going to pay dividends down the road. There's no question about it. It's going to be hard now, and that's why an education campaign needs to happen as this tax bill has been rolled out by the, by the Ways and Means Committee and that shifts to the Senate. They're need, they need to do their work, and the White House really needs to do their work on, on really selling this and why it matters to wages and why it matters to more jobs. So, Congressman, you and your staff are going through this big bill, because it is a big bill, uh, with a fine-tooth comb. Tell me the process that you're going through and how you're trying to reach out to your constituents just to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Well, first of all, we did a number of tax roundtables. We engaged small business owners. We engaged chambers of commerce. We engaged just regular citizens, and we did a series of tax roundtables all over South Louisiana over the past few weeks. Now that we actually have bill text, over 400 pages of bill text and a number of summaries, we're, we're emailing those out, we're posting them on our website, pushing them out on social media and telling people, hey, look, give us feedback. There is an opportunity to make some changes. And I'll tell you, we've already identified a few places where we have questions. We want to make sure we understand the, the intent behind some provisions and maybe even have a few tweaks. But we've got to make sure that, that as we move forward on this, on this legislation that we get it right. There are few things as pervasive as taxes in terms of this affects absolutely everyone. And we've got to make sure we do get it right to achieve the goals that, uh, that John was talking about. Um, so, Adam, I'm, I'm going to throw it to you in a second. But I, I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, the process and why we have a partisan process. Um, this, has, this, this, this tax bill, this tax reform bill, should have Democrats on board because it is not a tax cut for the wealthy. No. And, you know, I, I say that because I know a lot of people in Washington who are making a pretty good salary, and maybe a few of them are lobbyists, well-heeled lobbyists, and they're like, you know, there's nothing in here for me. But, so, but if you're a constituent back home in, in, in Louisiana, you know, that's probably a good thing, right? Middle, it, it is a good thing, and, and middle wage earners are really the target here. It's important you can go through all the statistics. It's important to keep in mind uh, the, 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 the lower wage earners actually don't pay taxes already. And so people are out there saying things that are distorted about, oh, well, this doesn't provide a tax break for some of the lower wage earners. And the reality is that if you're not paying taxes, I'm not sure how you reduce things even farther. Um, we've got the, the, the major objective here is making sure that we're incentivizing people to work hard, keeping a portion of their, a larger portion of their earnings, and helping to bring those companies here because we've got to bring more economic activity into the United States as opposed to just handing dollars from you to me and back and forth. We've got to bring more dollars, more economic activity, more jobs here, and that's what this achieves. So why do you think Democrats don't want to get on board? Do you think I, it's because you think it's Nancy Pelosi? You think it's uh, I, I think Richard Neal's a good guy. Um, there, there, there are some great people that are out there on both sides uh, of, of the aisle in the House and the Senate. There, there really are. But, but, but you could see this actually happening weeks ago, exactly how this was going to play out. You had people out there trying to define what this tax bill was going to do before it was even written. And people were out there saying, this is going to be a tax break for the rich. This is going to reward only the rich and penalize the middle wage earners and the lower wage earners. And, and, and even before this bill was written, they were out there saying it. You see them even this morning during the one-minute speeches lined up saying it, special order speeches last night lined up saying it. And the reality is, is that at the end of the day, when this does reduce taxes for the, the middle class, for the middle wage earners, for the families, you're going to have people with egg on their face, and they're going to have to explain why they opposed something like this, which, and it's going to be tough. Which I think it puts them in a very difficult situation. Adam, um, you're kind of our PR kind of visual storyteller. You know, what about the, how, how the Republicans rolled this thing out? Well, they've, they've, they've certainly attempted to do so many times over the last year, and it's, uh, it's finally come to this, whereas the congressman says we have – 400 and some odd pages of a bill. We can look at rates. We can take a look at how it actually impacts folks. And I think they've done a very good job to date. Uh, they, they rolled it out with, with a lot of fanfare. Uh, the president himself did not inflict uh, too much harm on the message and was fairly supportive. And even his representatives, including Gary Cohn, is out there reinforcing that the president uh, is really on board with every last bit of this. If I had a question for you, Congressman, it would be in the storytelling vein, what industries in particular uh, in your district and in Louisiana, uh, from shipbuilding to other things, uh, see a major impact here 
uh, in terms of investment, yeah. job growth. Can you talk about that for a second? How does it hit home for yeah. you all? So, so you, you have to look at things cumulatively. And so Mercatus Center did a study and determined that Louisiana is the most federally regulated state in the nation. 74% greater federal regulatory burden than any other, any other state. You take that, you add the tax code to it. Um, it makes it very uh, uncompetitive to, to be in the United States, to be in Louisiana in some cases. Our big industries, we have uh, a lot of port and maritime right. associated industries, a lot of petrochemical, a lot of energy production. The, those are some of the, 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 the real pillars of our economy in Louisiana. Those, those, those places, you, you can go offshore and uh, to other, other nations and you can produce energy. And as we've seen in 2011, over half of our nation's trade deficit was attributable to us importing oil. Um, uh, some of the chemical manufacturing, you can do that in other places where you have lower environmental standards, lower labor standards. So, so when you put the, our onus tax code um, on top of, uh, owner's tax code on top of these other regulations, right. it makes it easy to say, you know what, I'm going to Mexico, I'm going to China, Brazil, India, insert a country. And uh, we, this, this legislation is designed, and, and I'm going to keep saying this because I think it's so important, it's all about international competitiveness and helping to bring that back in addition to helping people keep a larger portion of their checks. So tell us a little bit about how your district is doing. We did, I just saw that the unemployment rate now nationally is at its lowest rate since 2000, which is pretty good, 4.1%, I think. It's right, pretty, yeah. pretty amazing. Uh, how are things in, in the 6th District of Louisiana? How are your people feeling about uh, how things are going? Just tell us what you think. Yeah, so, so at home, things are, things are going okay. We've, we've had some anomalies in Louisiana with unemployment rates compared to the national average. In some areas, it's actually been higher than the national average. What we've seen as a result of some of the energy policies and a lot of the regulatory burden that was uh, around over the last several years uh, is we lost about one-third of our oil and gas jobs in the state of Louisiana. Wow. And we saw something similar happen in the 70s and 80s. The thing that distinguished this one from the last one is that we recognized in this instance that we had some assets. One, the most advanced maritime transportation system in the nation. Number two, we have some of the, the most extensive energy pipeline systems in the nation. Number three, um, we have a readily available source of both oil and gas. We were able to flip from this oil and gas production, exploration and production industry to industrial manufacturing. So we're seeing this, this, this industrial revolution happening in Louisiana, $120 billion in industrial projects. Uh, that are underway or on the horizon in Louisiana right now. It is amazing what's happening. So we are seeing a transition, and there is some lag in that a bit, but, um, but, but seeing that void filled the way it's been filled, seeing people in Louisiana recognize their assets has been amazing. And how do they like, uh, they see, are they more confident with uh, the president and his kind of anti-regulatory zeal? Is that, is that working for them down there? It, 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 it very much is. And, and, and look, I'm not going to get into the whole partisan thing, but, the, but you know, Trump won handily in Louisiana. Um, and whenever you come in with an administration like the last that, that, that is uh, big advocates for regulation, particularly for environmental type areas, it has a disproportionate impact on us, like the Mercatus Center uh, study indicated. So we did see greater jobs job loss and harm to our economy, I think disproportionate as a result of some of the priorities of the previous administration, and we're absolutely seeing that change now. So John, you have um, some family interests in uh, Louisiana. Uh, your wife is a Préjean. Am I saying that correctly? I, I, I took French. Good. I would say that's pretty good. <laughs> I, I usually just say Préjean, but you can say it how you want. So you know, you've been there. What, what, you know, what, what kind of thoughts do you have about how things are going down there? Well, I, and I do, we get down there quite a bit, and I love it. Uh, and it, and we, yes, we do. Before, she was an Easton. She was a Prejean, and she was a Fontenot. And there's lots of uh, good good Cajun uh, blood in, in her. But I'll tell you, when we go down, and it, what you really feel is when you have these fluctuations of gas prices, uh, to the congressman's uh, point about how dependent they are on policies, but but also things out of their control, like, like the prices, uh, wow, what an impact it has on everybody, everybody in the community down there. Uh, certainly, you know, my, uh, my in-laws down there, but it, way beyond. So it really, what you said about, about the economy and, and, and how these policies are, are directly affecting them, it's so true. Theory two, man, it's getting hot in here. No matter what your theological beliefs may be about the causing of climate change, one thing we really can't dispute is the temperature, temperatures are rising, and that is having an impact on the environment. I say that because it's November and it's about 75 degrees outside. So my personal experience, you can disagree with me, but this is my personal experience. Here's my theory. 
We need to take proactive steps now to protect local communities from rising sea levels, and that will require smart planning and smart spending on critical infrastructure. Congressman Graves, you are a lot smarter about this stuff than I am. You have worked for years in the fields of risk mitigation and flood control. What should the government be doing better to prepare ourselves for the future? Yeah, it, it, um, it, I'm, a, I'm a numbers person, and, and, and numbers tell amazing stories here. So you have a lot of people that say, well, look, we can't afford to come in and make these investments in different Corps of Engineers or FEMA projects, resiliency-type projects. Let, let me give you a number that helps tell a story. Since 1980, we've had 218 disasters that have caused impact in excess of a billion dollars. 218. We've expended about $1.3 trillion responding to these. And just this year, Her Harvey, Irma, Maria, Nate, all just coming in extraordinary storms. Last year in Louisiana, we had a 1,000-year flood and a 500-year flood. I think Harvey was a 1,000-year hurricane. I mean, it makes me feel old going through all these extraordinary <laughs> events. And, and so, so we have two choices. We can continue to come in. And, and, and after the fact, spend exponentially more dollars picking up the pieces and, and of course, having the economic repercussions, the debt repercussions, or you can have principled criteria to identify the best investments in the front end, help make these communities more resilient. And, and, and that pays off over and over and over again. It'll pay for itself. Study after study shows it. One other thing. We don't have the option of, of not doing this. Right now, 10% of the land area in the United States is represented by coastal counties, parishes, and boroughs. Yet, over 40% of our population lives there. Wow, yeah. And they're continuing to trend toward, those, toward the water, toward the coastal areas. We, we don't have a choice. We've got to figure out how to have people live safely in these areas because that's where the trends are going. And um, so we're actually working on legislation right now. Uh, we had a hearing yesterday in the Transportation Committee. There was one in the Senate this week as well. Working on legislation right now that I hope we have out in November, part of the hurricane recovery package, changing the way, just shifting this paradigm from proactive uh, from reactive. What, what are, I'd like to ask you, what do you think are the biggest obstacles uh, toward getting there, getting and, and achieving some of these objectives you just laid out? Yeah, you know, personally and, and, and based on my experiences, I think one of the biggest problems, uh, quite frankly, is the Corps of Engineers. Uh, that's the agency that largely is responsible for carrying out a lot of these projects. Uh, the Corps of Engineers has a lot of trouble uh, uh, not getting in the way of themselves. And, and I, I like to ask people this, this question. If you were starting a mission right now within the federal government to, to build projects and make communities more resilient, would you say, hey, you know what? This needs to be in Department of Defense. Right. I'm, I'm going to guess you wouldn't <laughs> say that, yet that's where it is, and it's buried in this bureaucracy, and I think we really need to, to rethink how that should be structured, where it should be placed, and make it a higher priority in this country where we can get these projects finished. Let me ask you this question about risk mitigation, flood mitigation, flood control. How much of this should be the federal government? How much should it be the local governments? How much should it be the private sector? And how, you know, what are the, what's the role of insurance companies? Because, you know, they, they have the most to lose on all this stuff. And, and is there any way to leverage private dollars to build these things in a more efficient way? And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, planning is so important. And we know that stuff, people don't, you know, people are moving to the coast, right? Yeah, it's it's a real deal. So, so you, you bring up some really good points and some really good opportunities to solve these things. So, so number one, if you're going in and, and you're seeing this surge of people moving to the coast, let's make sure that when people are moving to the coast and we're doing developments, we're learning from the mistakes of the past. We're making sure that we're employing the, the, the uh, more resilient building standards. We're building things at the right heights and elevations to avoid those types of disasters. And in some cases, the, those lessons learned are not being applied. Something else in regard to the private sector role here. It, let's say that you have a community that has 500 people and cumulatively they're paying make up numbers five million dollars a year in flood insurance premiums and 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 you look at that and you say you know what if we came in and spent 20 million bucks we could build a levy and we could lower their insurance premiums from 500 million cumulatively down to a million right. there's a private sector opportunity in right. there financing opportunity profit making and huge benefits to these communities and so we've got to we've got to help um, lay the groundwork for some of these scenarios where the private sector where insurance companies can come in and improve the resilience of these areas, help to reduce the actuarial risk there. I mean, you have win-win-wins across the board by, by setting up the, the scenario where, where private sector can come in and solve problems like that. I, I, th I was thinking about Harvey and, you know, it was huge, obviously, devastating hurricane. But a lot of those people who got flooded out didn't, were not on the flood insurance they didn't have flood insurance. Yeah, eighty-three uh, percent. It's amazing. Yeah. And so, what do you do? Well, you know, we don't. We're not going to let them just die. 
So we got the government's going to step in. So this is something where smart planning is really because things are changing and we need to be ready for it, right? Well, they, they absolutely are. And, and as I noted earlier, having 2,000 year storms within roughly a year's period of time, another 500 year storm in a year and a half. I mean, obviously, we are seeing trends. We've got to make sure that, uh, that these areas are resilient. But most importantly, the fiscal conservative thing to do is actually make the proactive investments. I mean, that's what actually pays off. And I'll say it again study after study show you save anywhere from $3 um, to uh, eight dollars and for every dollar you invest well and part in, of the uh, yeah and part of the challenge too with this is that the competition for dollars you're talking about a big infrastructure package and you, of course you would want to be part of that you've got crumbling bridges cr crumbling roads all across the country but this is about really saving lives in a in a big way that we just that we just witnessed i i want to jump in here for a second and i want to ask you congressman when when you articulate this to folks back home they know what you're talking about they see it um, and everyone's got a different story in their district. But how are you communicating about this with folks in your caucus? And, and what are you doing to help them understand the kind of proactive investments that everybody is going to realize the benefit of, even if you're not a victim of a major storm? How are those conversations going? Well, look, it's a, it's a big education campaign. Again, this is, this is what I did uh, for a living uh, a couple jobs back, and, I, and I've had an opportunity to spend a lot of time working in this space. But, but we've been doing a lot of individual meetings. We had uh, hearings in the Transportation Committee just yesterday. We went down to Miami and did a field uh, visit down there, did a roundtable or listening session with a number of folks. And so we're trying to travel around the country. We're working with individual members of Congress and helping to educate them and show them these models. I, I think, for example, the, the, the House flood insurance bill that's moving right now, I think that it misses the mark because it misses this opportunity on recognizing the return on investment by, by, by uh, making sure that we have resilient construction, resilient investments on the front end and being proactive. So this is a bipartisan uh, issue. Folks on the other side of the aisle that you're working with believe that this is something we need to do immediately as well. So they're sort of, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So you made some news and I'm going to ask John Easton to talk a little bit about, about a very sim important, significant culture that you represent. <laughs> John Easton, do you want to take this question? Well, sure. I, 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 I took note of it just be, because of uh, uh, some kin I have in, uh, in Louisiana, uh, South Louisiana, I should say. And you introduced a bill that would, uh, an amendment that would declare uh, Cajuns as an, as an endangered species. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. All right, so this, i got to give a little little groundwork here. So Louisiana, we've lost about 2,000 square miles of our coast. And so how big is that? That's the state of Rhode Island. It would be gone. And, and so we've, wow. and, and, and it's largely a result of how the Corps of Engineers has managed the Mississippi River and the Chafalaya River systems down there. They cut off all the sediment, and we began retreating land versus growing as we were before. So we've been doing a lot of work on Endangered Species Act reform, looking at ways to help improve the efficiency of regulations. And, and I'm looking at, at uh, how endangered species are, tre are treated, whether it's a reptile, an insect, or what have you, and all the protections that those things get. Yeah. And meanwhile, I'm watching how the federal government is undermining our own future, our own livelihood, our own habitat uh, in, in South Louisiana. I said, you know what? I want that. I want that. So we said, all right, here we go. We're going to go ahead and file an amendment. And I will tell you, the folks in the office, I think I had to tell them six times before they realized I was serious. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but we got Nancy. that amendment. We, we got that amendment drafted and uh, went ahead and filed it up. And I'll, I'll tell you, we ran in a little bit of opposition. The chairman was trying to tell me that we were an invasive species <laughs> instead of an endangered one. But um, because we, of course, did come from Nova Scotia, we were kicked out of Canada. But, but I reminded him that that happened a, a full hundred years before his state of Utah time became a state so <laughs> I'm not sure what that made him but uh, but 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 you know the point was is that we, we really need to put things in perspective we need to think about people and shouldn't be treating insects recti reptiles and other things in a way that um, that puts them in a at a higher status than individuals well sometimes. and coming from the state of Oregon I can tell you about protecting fish and insects and animals to the nth degree so I and these are these folks this culture in in South Louisiana that that the congressman is honored to represent are fantastic people. I, I love your amendment. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you. And I'm sure your wife does too. Yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> I think she does. Theory three, bum rap. The approval rating for Congress is currently standing at 18%. Constituents are angry at their members of Congress, angry at the lack of progress, disillusioned and disgusted with what they perceive to be endemic corruption in the nation's capital. But here's my theory. Congress is getting a bum rap. Members of Congress work incredibly hard every day, sacrificing their privacy their families, their fortunes, 
to do the people's business. They deserve applause and acclamation, not derision and disgust. Congressman Graves, uh, talk about your job, what it's like to be a member of Congress, how, how hard the, you, not how hard you work, because that would be a little bit self aggrandizing but, but, you know, just kind of the, yeah. the fact that, you know, for example, I was talking to a member of Congress the other day, and, you know, he wanted to be there for Halloween for his kids, but he's here. And, you know, this is, these are the tough decisions that, that, that you make to represent the people of, of your district. And just tell, tell us about your work. Yeah, so, so um, putting it in context, I'd never run for office before, so this was a whole new thing for me. And uh, so we spend usually four days a week up here uh, in Washington, and then we're home three days a week, which usually includes Saturday and Sunday. But, but what happens is you work seven days a week uh, because when you're up here, obviously you're working. Uh, I sleep in the office and usually wake up wait, around. Wait, you, you sleep in the office? I, I do sleep in the office, yeah. Does it hurt your back? Uh, it, 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 it can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I wake up at 5.30. I usually don't go to sleep till probably 12.30 at night because I'm here to work, and I get that. I'm here, I'm here to work those four days a week. Um, but then when you go back home, that's, you know, the, the, the Friday or the Monday, that's the day you have to actually meet with uh, constituents. And then, of course, Saturday and Sunday fairs, festivals, parades, and other things. So you're working seven days a week. But then the thing that I realized after becoming elected, going to the grocery store is work. Because you don't just go to the grocery store and do the list that you're supposed to be picking up. You're walking down the aisle, and people want to talk about taxes. People want to talk about regulations. People want to talk about immigration, health care. And so it, it really was amazing to me as people would start talking. I was like, what are, you, are they talking to me? And I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it, it, but it, it's, it's incredible how everything you do is actually, is actually work. When I go to church, when I go to the grocery store, when I go to the doctor's office, everywhere you go, you end up having conversations uh, with, with people and talking about issues. And so it, um, it's very interesting in the way that, uh, again, it was a surprise to me how you can't distinguish weekends or family time or anything else from, from, from work because you're representing all the time. Um, so it, it is uh, hours intense and everything else, but, but I also want to take a, I want to take a shot at Congress, which maybe, maybe I shouldn't do. But I do think that we need to take a step back. You, you talked about bipartisanship earlier. I think we need to take a step back and look at the structure of Congress, the organizational structure, the role of parties, the way the committees and leadership work. We, we, we have a great government structure, but I, I really think that there's some things that we could do to help modernize, use technology to update, um, uh, the way that we do our job. I feel like in some cases, and I've described it to people as being on a bike where you put it in that gear where you're spinning like this, only to advance, uh, 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 you know, 10 yards. Right. And so I do think we should, on a bipartisan basis, basis, take a step back and look at the organizational structure of the Congress. I think there's some reforms and innovations we can do to help improve the efficiency of our work and outcomes. I am, um, when I worked for Bob Michael, a long time ago, I served on the, uh, the committee. I was a staff member for the committee that reorganized Congress. And we had a lot of ideas out there. One of the ideas that I, th I think is you got to fix, fix the appropriations and authorization system because we spend so much time wasting time on the budget process that doesn't work. I think also, you know, trying to make it easier and more family friendly for people like, like you to serve, you know, you're, you're, you're missing your kids. It's actually a real personal sacrifice for you to do this job because you have to, you have to live in your, out of your office, which I, I think is insane, but you have no choice, really, because it's, it's really hard to maintain two residences. Um, bad on your back. I don't even know how you do it. <laughs> bad on my back. I mean, <laughs> my back hurts just thinking about it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but uh, it's a short commute to work, <laughs> right? Uh, but you know, I, I, you know, it used to be back in the old days uh, that families would stay up here, and, and that would be a lot easier. And frankly, you know, it, it was a lot easier f for keeping families together and creating a sense of of community. But then that got out of style. And also, D.C. is really expensive. It is. And um, go ahead, John. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would add to it. Of course, it's a personal sacrifice. It's really hard work. I've worked for a number of members of Congress. I know exactly what the, the, of which the congressman speaks. But the other thing that, that is, I think, hard on members right now is, is the divisiveness of the, of the, of the nation, how, how toxic the politics are. On the one hand, uh, everybody expects members of Congress to get something done, and they're, they're held to a high standard, uh, which they should be. But on the other hand, the, uh, many, many of their constituents are saying, uh, don't compromise. You know, don't you know, hold the line. So a lot of members are stuck between 
working because to get something done you, you have to compromise and you have to work with the other party otherwise this place is just frozen so i i, I really feel for members like congressman graves who come here and and they're really trying to get something done but there's the divisiveness of the nation is pulling everybody back so i want to talk a little bit about um you you're going on a trip this week to puerto rico that's a bipartisan trip right it is and um with the people from the senate too apparently <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Truly bipartisan. I'm a house guy. Hey, look, they to, they, they're going to need somebody to carry their bags. I, I uh, you know, we talk a little bit about risk of flood mitigation and climate change and things like that. I mean, what do you expect to get out of this trip? Well, uh, what first of all, you, you've seen so much misinformation about what's happening in the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico and other places. And so uh, being able to actually get there on the ground, talk to the local residents, see what it is that they need as we work to do another uh, emergency appropriations package that we'll be moving hopefully later this month. Uh, that's something really important. Secondly, uh, understanding some of the thematic problems with disaster recovery, the problems we've experienced in Louisiana, right. the, leaning, the leaning forward and being proactive versus reactive, and just making sure that as we begin this paradigm shift, that we're doing it in a way that doesn't just help Louisiana, help Texas, but helps Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Florida, and all these other places as well. So I'm really looking forward to that trip and, and hearing from locals, hearing from some of the, the flood victims. So, Congressman, uh, we usually have a lightning round. Um, we're going to modify it slightly um, to ask you your advice on what is the best Cajun dish and where can where's the best place to get it? Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are... The food down there is is absolutely amazing, and and you know when you say the best, I, I, I automatically have twenty things come come to mind. Um, um, uh, alligator sauce pecan is 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 pretty pretty good stuff, um, and 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 you gotta you, in terms of place to get it, you you've got to make sure that the alligator that 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 the Hold on, when hold it, on. What, what does this taste like? Thank you for interrupting. I really <laughs> needed some alligator more sauce. Alligator sauce pecan. I've never had that. I've never even heard it's, of it. Uh, it's kind of like a tomato-y uh, gumbo with, with alligator. But the, oh. the thing is, it's really important with the alligator meat that when you find that alligator, and usually, you know, the, the side of uh, Highway 23, Highway 1, <laughs> Highway 90, you got to make you got to make sure that the, the gator was hitting the head, <laughs> because otherwise the meat gets bruised and it just doesn't taste as good. Um, and so you you, you got to make sure you, you get the right gator. No, like I'll tell you, one of my favorite dishes, and, it, and it's amazing. We have three kids, uh, eight, ten, and twelve. They love these as well. Um, char grilled oysters. I mean, just just uh, some of these places have made this just an incredible delicacy. Have perfected these recipes. Uh, Drago's, uh, Mansur's in Baton Rouge does a great job. Uh, even uh, Acme, uh, which which has places all over, uh, amazing. They, they they literally they shuck an oyster. They keep uh, they keep it on the half shell. You, you do butter, garlic, and Parmesan cheese, which pretty much you could put on a roadkill alligator and make yeah. taste good as well. <laughs> but uh, but but fantastic. Uh, John Eason, your what, what's your favorite? Boy, it really depends on the day. First, you got to start with a light beer. That 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 is that is crucial uh, to any of these dishes, and, and and it is it is very common there. But I would say you know an etouffee, or uh, I mean, I, I I would say that uh, I am going to try this dish that you just mentioned because I have never had it, and it sounds delicious. I have to say that you're talking about your three kids. I have three kids. My youngest, Lila from the time that she was probably five years old, was a huge crawfish fan. So yeah. a good crawfish boil, any day. I'll, I'll just, if you come up with one, I'll be there. Well, I'll tell you, we actually do those up here. And uh, we will bring hundreds of pounds of crawfish up here. And it's incredible the, the, the attraction that that event uh, has just because people like to eat crawfish. And even up here, so we bring people from Louisiana. We bring our Louisiana crawfish to cook them. And uh, those, are, those are amazing. I will say that my daughter, Molly who's five, her favorite New Orleans Cajun dish is a beignet. Mm. <laughs> I can see why. There you go. There you, go. Yeah. you mean a donut. <laughs> Love that chicken from Pop. <laughs> there it is. All right, well, winner, winner, chicken dinner. All right, well, thank you so much, Congressman Garrett Grace, for joining us on the Fury Theory Podcast, brought to you by EFB Advocacy. EFB means excellent for business. Yeah, baby. All right.